Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Test Tubes and, ca- and Cauldrons. Wow, see, I can't even talk today, guys. I can't even talk. A podcast where we talk about the science behind spirituality. In this episode, we are going to cover a topic that a lot of people have expressed interest in, and I think that Hanny and I in particular are quite excited to talk about, and that is entheogens. But before we get into that, I'm going to pass it over to Bell, who will do our What Happened on This Day. Alrighty. So today is August 3rd, and it was the birth of Robert Ernest House, an American physician who championed the use of scopolamine. Someone correct me if that is incorrect. And hydrobromide in criminology, which became known as truth serum. Based on research into its use as a general birth anesthetic by J. Christian Goss, Haas interpreted from the results that a patient in the twilight state was unable to tell a lie. From 1924, House convinced Texas criminologists to use the drug to assist in determination of guilt or innocence of a suspect. Later, legal challenges in CIA research in the 1950s showed that House's confidence was misplaced. Its value was very much exaggerated. Any truth confessed under the drug's influence was distorted by the drug's hallucinogenic side effects, leading to its use being discontinued. Scopolamine is still used in minute doses to control motion sickness and as a veterinary pre-anesthetic medication. It is also one of the active ingredients in nightshades like Datura, which brings us to our topic for today. And I think we also wanted to put out a content warning for this episode in general. We're going to be talking about drugs and drug use focus on entheogens so just know that going in yeah if this is triggering for you you might not want to listen to this episode (laughs) just a heads up but first i think before we get started it's crucial to talk about what an entheogen is so hanny i know you did some research on the like original etymology yeah so it comes from ancient greek as all good things do some could argue (laughs) and from entheos meaning full of the god inspired or possessed the genus thai, which means to come into being. So it has a direct connection to divinity. But more broadly, we can say it's a psychoactive substance, most commonly of botanical origin, although not always, and it's used in a religious or ritual context. This might be to communicate with an inner god or the subconscious, to commune with spirits, or to induce dreams for divinatory purposes, or for closeness with the divine. Interestingly, the root of the word psychedelic is also related to one's psyche, to reveal part of one's mind or one's soul. So there's a lot to do with interior experiences versus external experiences, um, but we'll kind of get to that a little bit later in the episode. The history behind the evolution of the term entheogen is actually really interesting. So it was originally coined in a short academic paper from 1979 that was published in the Journal of Psychedelic Drugs by a combination of academic and independent scholars, um, also from a range of different backgrounds, including both scientific and then also some religious scholars as well. And in this paper, they discuss the brief history um, of modern confusion over psychoactive substances and how the current names are really lacking in helping people kind of understand what's happening. So hallucinogens, right, this word implies a visual deception and delirium. Another term that's kind of thrown around more by psychologists is psychotomimetic. Yeah, no, pronunciation is going to be fun today, which means just a drug-inducing psychosis. Obviously, this term isn't used now for reasons like you want to tell somebody that they're psychotic. Um... But they also argued that the word psychedelic created an association with mental illness because of its linguistic similarity towards like psyche and psychology. And in the paper, they specifically defined entheogens as a substance that has been historically used to induce states of shamanic and ecstatic possession. So basically, as Kenny said above, um, an entheogen is a psychoactive drug taken to bring about a spiritual experience. But it's important to clarify here that when we're talking about an entheogen, Like, that word was coined to include, like, the psychoactive aspects of it, but also kind of the spiritual purposes behind the use of this kind of, like, substance. Okay, so let's then maybe talk about the different classes of entheogens. And there's a lot, and we're not going to be able to cover all of them, but we can kind of just start. Yeah, so there's entheogens, which we've already mentioned, they're related to um, kind of divinity, ecstatic, mystical experiences. But there are also um, onerogens, which are dream-inducing substances. And there's kind of crossover between these two. Like, 
you hear people using things like mugwort a lot, for example, mugwort teas to induce dreams um, due to the thujone. And some entheogens will also cross over with these experiences. So some studies suggest that DMT, which is the active compound in ayahuasca, is a hallucinogen, but the brain activity of people using it um, seems to induce a sort of waking dream type state. The um, brain waves are, are characteristic of those who are in a deep dream. So it's kind of interesting how these two states are utilized for spiritual purposes. In terms of hallucinogens, there's not really a formal distinction between them, but broadly speaking, we have psychedelics, so that includes classic hallucinogens like psilocybin, which is in magic mushrooms, LSD, delirients, like anticholinergic drugs, atropine, um, scolopramine, I'm going to also struggle with pronunciation, <laughs> um, anything in kind of nightshades, like Detora, Brugnantia, that kind of thing. The, the name is quite obvious there, it makes you quite delirious, quite n- not quite fully with your faculties. And then you have dissociative drugs, like sal- salvia, and that causes you to have kind of out-of-body experiences and detachments from the environment. And finally, many also have the property of inducing um, euphoria or ecstasy, which um, tend to be quite important to these ritual states. Um, I think maybe we'll um, talk a little bit more about how that how important that is. All right. So actually moving into that, let's go ahead and talk about some of the uses of entheogens in history. And I'm going to give it to Fel because I am not a history person, but she is. So <laughs> Fel, talk to us about the history of entheogens. Yeah. So the history of entheogens is actually fairly complicated when doing some research for this um, and even just like when I'm reading books on my own there's an interesting thing that seems to happen with a lot of like newer scholarship where there seems to be some almost walking back of proponents like discussing like entheogen use in historical situations so, like, for example, there was the very controversial book, The Sacred Mushroom and the Cross, which basically ties the advent of Christianity to, I think it's, yeah, psilocybin, and that, like, a lot of the early Christians were under the influence of psilocybin, which is how Christianity developed. Very controversial book, came out in the 1970s. And I think around that time, the 70s specifically, and I think a little bit before then, we see a lot of scholarship of people, like, with the... Oracle of Delphi, for example, discussing, oh, there were fumes, um, or oh, she was chewing some sort of entheogenic substance. However, there are there are no fumes at Delphi. They've done archaeological digs and have discovered no such amount that would induce a state of, of frenzy. And the things that the the oracle was cited as having chewed with like laurel leaves, which is not entheogenic. So it's quite a bit complicated. Because we're also not entirely sure what is people dismissing a divine experience and what is, you know, seen as valid, I guess, not to overuse that term. We definitely see use of drugs and entheogens in across cultures. So like, that's not like, I'm not saying that they weren't a thing, but it, it's definitely very, very complicated. It, it's often seen alongside of other forms of trance inducing, I don't know, the right term is, but like, For example, the cult of Dionysus, there's often you see consumptions of alcohol, which is not entheogenic, but then there's also accounts of them perhaps eating wild plants, which may or may not have been entheogenic, depending on what they were. But then you also consider the cult of Dionysus is very heavy into dancing and rhythm. If you've ever been in a group that is experiencing a spiritual moment, regardless of drugs, like you'll know that there it it is like it it really messes with your brain just wanted to get that out of the way to to clear up some of the misconceptions and some of the rockier scholarship on entheogens we'll talk about this a little bit more later but i will say that like scientifically speaking like sleep deprivation and like dancing and those kind of things like have very similar effects like as psychedelics in terms of like why we experience kind of the same things in those states but we'll get into that later it's actually quite interesting Yeah, I would just say like a lot of entheogen use is very new scholarship around it is fairly rocky. Um, I think there was a huge push in the 70s to kind of like explain away certain divine experiences by being like, they were all on drugs. Uh, Like people would be like, oh, in Salem, it was the bread. And I'm like, that's no, that that theory, the theory of everyone in Salem being very high (laughs) during the Salem witch trials has long been like long been disproven 
I, something that I wish I had gotten time to, to look into before going to this, but was the flying ointments. I'm not sure if anyone knows exactly the, the history of flying ointments in their actual usage and if they were actually used or if it was, you know, one of those torture confessions that was not exactly the truth. Like most of the stuff that I read about flying ointments was people being like, I saw these crazy witches using these poisonous herbs to like do certain things. So it's hard to say how much of it was actually historically used because a lot of it is secondhand accounts taken in the midst of the witch craze, which I don't think is exactly the best of sources. Yeah. Also, like, this is totally unrelated, but I would like to know how they knew that all of the herbs were like poisonous because there are poisonous herbs that just look like leaves off of a tree. <laughs> well, there's one way to find out, right? I, I don't want to dismiss like the presence of ergot in certain rituals, for example. There definitely has been Although, again, not as much scholarship, but there definitely has been evidence found of in things like get the kaikion, which is a, a Greek drink, which is barley, milk, and wine, and sometimes pennyroyal. Uh, sounds nasty, but um, I was considered a peasant's drink, right? But this was served at the Lucinia Mysteries, but it was also just served randomly. So it was clearly not considered to be hallucinogenic all the time if it was also considered a peasant's drink but there were traces of ergot found in cups in system in like yeah i think they found it in someone's like tooth or something ridiculous i was reading but that doesn't necessarily mean that it was the norm or that they i don't think you can necessarily purposely at that time find something infected with ergot can't, i don't think it can be discounted but it's definitely wasn't necessarily a purposeful thing I was just going to mention regarding the um, ergot um, and ergotamines because there's lots of um, components which are similar to psilocybin in ergot and that's why it's uh, hallucinogenic. Um, I actually am just wondering about archaeologically how they discriminate that because obviously um, it's a fungus so it can colonize lots of things and one of the examples I have here are bindweeds so they often they don't have necessarily um, always endogenous psychedelics but if they are infected with a fungus, um, uh, an uh, ergoline fungus, then they will the fungus will produce the psychedelics, for example. And so that's what induces the hallucinogenic effect. And so I kind of wonder, like, is it possible that there's any kind of external contamination on archaeological artifacts, which makes them think, oh, yeah, this, there was obviously, you know, this hallucinogenic fungus they were consuming, but actually it was just something that was in the environment anyway. Like, I, I'm not sure how reliable that evidence can be. Yeah, I've seen people counter, like, that's why people don't immediately embrace the ergot theory for, like, the kaikion in general, because of, because of those reasons that it's, it's not necessarily indicative of, like, this is what was happening at the time or what caused this reaction. I think a lot of it was kind of scapegoating. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. um, or or like finding a reason to support their theory instead of actually like, I don't know <laughs> yeah because like a lot of it um, what was it ergot was found inside a vase and within the dental calculus of a 25 year old man however these were all fragments and again there could have been so many other things affecting them that it's not necessarily indicative that ergot was like the main reason for them to have a divine experience yeah there were some other examples I found um, so the Aztecs had Tena Nepatl which is a plant with an active ingredient with psilocybin in. And the evidence they have of that, other than kind of some living traditions which are passed down, are actually these particular vases which were thought to be used as ritual enemas. I'm not sure how exactly they determined that those, that's what they were used for, but that's, that's the archaeological evidence um, for its usage. Um, there are also other things, like I said, living traditions that should use salvia. And um, salvia is really interesting because it contains um, salvinorin A, and it's uh, a very unique hallucinogen. It's not really like any others. It's, it doesn't have uh, nitrogen in, so it's a non-alcaloid. And it's a dissociative, so it's it's quite different to the other experiences which we've described here. And there's also peyote, which is uh, an active ingredient as mescaline, another alkaloid. And it's spiritually, spiritually significant to particular Native American groups. And um, the Native American church is actually legally allowed to use it despite the, it otherwise being outlawed for people. Um, because of that spiritual significance. I think another important thing to note, like entheogens have been documented in, in living traditions and in other historical traditions, 
And in certain traditions, like in certain Greek mystery cults, there is explicit reference to certain herbs. However, they are veiled in like secrecy or they are referred to with a euphemism. So sometimes like the what the entheogen actually was or if it was actually an entheogen is sometimes hard to find for that reason because it was considered a secret um, and thus it was used euphemistically. Yeah, I've noticed that there's a lot of assumptions being made. Like there's still an active debate whether um, the Vikings, for example, they used fly agaric or henbane and it's uh, they're basically trying to backwards engineer this and say well this this plant in particular is is more likely to produce this effect so they think it's either fly agaric or henbane and they're basically just trying to say okay well these plants were both present at this time these plants could produce these effects at this time but they're not really able to narrow it down from the limited historic um historiography like you say so another one's blue lotus a lot of people have probably used blue lotus it's i think it's probably a popular one to use today um i was surprised that it has an, an alkaloid, in, alkaloid in which is a dopamine agonist so it's like an actual psychedelic and it's not like muggle which is sort of has thujone and people kind of debate whether thujone actually has a psychedelic effect or not like it is it does legitimately have a psychedelic effect um, dopamine is uh, implicated in lots of things in the brain it's uh, in your movement center but it's also kind of your reward system so it's, it's kind of a mild psychedelic so ayahuasca which is used by the santo daime probably you've heard of ayahuasca it is um a plant compound which has the active ingredient is DMT, but um, DMT only acts for like six minutes at a time. So it also contains monoamine oxidase inhibitor, which prolongs the effect. Um, it's legal in certain areas for ritual purposes. It tends to induce feelings of uh, seeing God, very like closeness to the divine. It also makes people vomit a lot, but that's often seen as like a purification process, as, as, as I was understanding from my research. Some other interesting ones are Ibogaine, which is used by the Bushi cult, and it's being adapted into an antidepressant. And finally, Mad Honey, which I think, Phil, you know a little bit about this, right? It's from honey made from bees that are near to rhododendrons, which allow them to incorporate gryanotoxin. And it can be used as a poison as well, actually. I don't know if you know anything about the spiritual use of that, but I just thought it was really interesting. I, I did very little research. Well, like I said, when I initially learned that rhododendrons could cause something called mad honey, I was like, that's super cool. And then I started eyeballing all the rhododendrons <laughs> that are around me <laughs> and all the bees that love them. I couldn't find much evidence for actual spiritual uses. A lot of it was talking more about poisons and people accidentally like hurting themselves. <laughs> with like mad honey i wasn't really able to find a legitimately sourced discussion on if it was ever used in like a spiritual context beyond just tormenting your enemies I was say, like, lots of these would be like super dangerous to use like rhinotoxin for example it, it would um, affect your cardiovascular system because of the cns effects like detura things like that we'll talk about them later but they affect your cardiovascular system and they can cause you to literally die so a lot of these um probably if they were used then they would have been used sparingly because of the risk to life which yeah leads me to a disclaimer <laughs> if before you engage in any kind of like entheogens or drug induced like spirituality please consult with your physician um and just like make sure that you are cleared to do so because like for instance if you have an unknown cardiovascular like disease or issue and you take something that enhances like cardiovascular system and increases like your heart rate and all of that could be detrimental. Um, so just be careful when you work with this kind of stuff. So um, out of curiosity, what do you both think maybe the most common entheogens are in the occult community? I mean, mugwort for sure. Mugwort and uh, would you consider wormwood an entheogen? I think they're kind of mugwort adjacent, right? Like yeah. they're kind of the same, the same or like very similar species. Yeah. Mugwort, wormwood, and then, like, when people get into, like, actual, like, the poison path, people talk about Datura, Henbane, Belladonna. I've seen Dittany of Crete used in, like, mundane, like, or, like, not as, like, bad flying ointments, but I'm like, I don't know what the properties of Dittany of Crete are that would cause those effects, but. Yeah, Mugwort's definitely the one that I hear of the most, like, within the witchcraft community. And I found a really interesting paper um, that's a good review of Mugwort and, like, where it comes from and its history, like medicinal uses, and also like the science behind its actions. I will link in the description for people if you want to read it. But yeah, that's definitely the biggest one that I hear, like mugwort tea and stuff. That's something that you just have to be careful with because I don't think a lot of people do their research like prior to trying mugwort or like mugwort tea or mugwort oil. And I'm like, yeah, I will say if you have a womb 
<laughs> be careful of mugwort. <laughs> if you have your period, be careful of mugwort. If you are pregnant, do not consume. Do not look at mugwort or pennyroyal for that matter. Well, there's a couple of chemicals within mugwort. Like if you were to steep it or like do an, an essential oil extraction um, that are quite toxic like very very toxic um, and again if you if you do it doing oil extraction then you're concentrating those substances and so they're going to be even more concentrated than they are if you just like did it to or something so just be careful <laughs> use it sparingly i wouldn't recommend actually using mug or oil at least not ingesting it if you're from the middle ages it's fun i have a medieval cookbook and they're just like just sprinkle mugwort all over it um they use mugwort like sage back in the middle ages which is always just fun just like parsley or cilantro sprinkle it on top of everything. Yeah, basically. <laughs> like half these recipes are just like, oh, here's some, uh, here's like a little bread stuffed with mugwort and cheese. And I'm like, oh boy. It's still used in a lot of Asian cooking, actually. Like, yes, that's true. Uh, if you're into like home cafe videos, which as I have mentioned, <laughs> I am. They make like these like sexy black lattes and like black cakes. They are stuff. really cool. Like mugwort um, cake. Um, They're so cool looking. I've never actually like eaten mugwort though. Yeah, I don't really react to it. It just makes me really, really tired. So why do we think people use entheogens? And what and when they do use them, what effects are they expecting? I think people fall into generally like two very broad categories. One are people use entheogens just to like have fun, recreational use, to enjoy life and like de-stress. Um, but I think when it comes to the spiritual community, a lot of times people use entheogens to elicit spiritual experiences and to maybe remove like blockages that they can't overcome through like other methods like meditation or like chanting mantras or, you know, whatever the case may be. I think that's what I see it used for more in the spiritual context. But what do you both think? I think there are lots of kind of shamanic type paths where it's often used for closeness to those particular plants. Um, but they're thought of as like plant allies, plant guides. And that's particularly with plants like datura. Um, I'll get into that a little bit later, but that's a very prominent aspect of people's experience with that plant. Yeah, and I agree, kind of, kind of removing blockages. I think there is somewhat of a, sh a shortcut, I guess. Is I don't know if that's the right word, but it's almost like a, a guarantee uh, that you will have some kind of mystical experience or a near guarantee, whereas there are other ways of inducing those kind of mystical experiences, whereas, but they might be a little bit more challenging, like fasting for a long time, lots of like intense prayer, um, all of those other factors. I think too, entheogens can often be beneficial for solitary paths. I think it's a lot easier to enter a trance state with another person, just it's totally anecdotal, but I mean, it's it, once you get into a rhythm, you know, your body just naturally mimics or reacts to the other person. And there's this rhythm and trance that is created when, when there's more than one person. I mean, I've definitely experienced it in group settings before uh, where no any sort of alcohol or any substance was ever used. But I, I think when a solitary path, it can be easier to get yourself into a headspace with certain forms of entheogens i've used like mugwort and wormwood before and it mostly just like helps again like astro was saying to sort of like clear or like not clear the mind exactly but to alter the mind and prepare the mind for what is to come and make it a little bit easier to enter a sort of receptive state i guess so i actually have a question for both of you that just popped into my head do you consider alcohol to be an entheogen i guess it depends on how it's used. For me, I only consume alcohol ritually. So for me, since it's like put in this sort of special place, I feel like there's almost like a placebo <laughs> that happens. Um, just the importance that I place on alcohol in that regard, that because I'm consuming it, that there's this other sort of alteration that happens because I don't drink normally. Another thing that I have done before is made wormwood wine, wormwood infused wine. It does not taste great. Got to dilute it with a lot of honey. Tastes bad, but it. <laughs> but I, it was definitely like a, a very ritualistic experience. I don't know. I, I definitely think it depends on. I think certain certain of these things, it's defined by your relationship it's from like an animistic perspective, your relationship to the plant or to the, the ritual. I guess like someone that I I practice with has a very special relationship with mugwort, and so for them it is a lot induces a, a lot more in them 
Uh, whereas for me, it literally just makes me very tired. It doesn't really do a whole lot if I drink it at least. Yeah. So uh, first of all, kudos to you for only drinking alcohol in a ritual place because I could not. Um, alcohol and coffee. That's what I live on. No, but I I don't think that alcohol is an entheogen, but at the same time, I guess, okay, let me rephrase that. For me, I don't consider it one because alcohol doesn't ever kind of get me into that state. It's just like, it loosens me up, but in a different way. Like I actually, I said I didn't, I hadn't drank mugwort tea, but I think I have. I did it once when I had a friend over. And that one time I do recall like being a little more like fuzzy in the head a little bit than like with alcohol, which just like makes me very talkative and a little obnoxious. It's so there's like, <laughs> there's different effects, right? And I, alcohol to me does not elicit any kind of like spiritual feeling whatsoever. I'm not even even close to that. And even when you get to the point where it like would, I just generally feel fuzzy as like out of it instead of it's, it's, it's different. It's a different kind of feeling for me. So I don't think that I would personally consider it to be an entheogen, though I do know people use alcohol as one in like ritual practice. So if it works for you, then like, great. Maybe I've just had too much and it no longer has. Didn't we, make, didn't we make a joke that we should do a spiritual shower thoughts or we all drink mugwort tea? We should. We should. That would be so fun. But you know, like even for me, even though I've said that mugwort makes me really tired, it does like it give me like that weird fuzzy feeling. It's like it, it's not exactly like a high, but it's definitely like a fuzziness, which then usually makes me fall asleep. I have made mugwort salves before, which make me less tired and seem to have a, at least some effect. Yeah. What about you, Henny? What do you think? Ooh, um, I actually am not sure. I think I think I tend to agree that it is down to the the user experience like I don't know that I would class it as an entheogen just of itself because um I'll kind of get into this um, a little bit later but there are studies which try and define the mystical experiences caused by entheogens and I think you could definitely say that not all of those qualities apply to alcohol that doesn't mean that you can't use alcohol in that spiritual way certainly there's a historical precedent for it and certainly people do you it do do it but it's not uh, an innate entheogen necessarily I would say like it's it, it doesn't have that kind of guarantee of, of providing a mystical experience every single time also I get palpitations when I drink so I can't I can't, I can't drink unless I want like really bad heart palpitations so it's well known that entheogens um, especially psilocybin and DMT or DMT containing substances can elicit mystical experiences so this includes feelings of unity with God being able to see deities or see spirits um, in a scientific sense, there have been many efforts made to quantify and narrow down exactly what constitutes a mystical experience. So I pulled out one study just to kind of see like what is a mystical experience and like what does science say about this. Um, so the study I found was uh, around 1,600 people. Um, they, they advertised their study on Erowid, which if you don't know, it's a website where people share their experiences on various drugs. Um, the demographic was a little bit limited in that it was mostly white people from the US. It was gender balance, really wide age range from around 18 to 80. 18 to 83 and most of these people were spiritual but not religious i think around um 13 of them said that they were religious and 16 uh, were not spiritual or religious at all um, and this study was basically looking at this particular questionnaire which um, it's called the mystical experience questionnaire and trying to identify the common factors in the questionnaire which would define the mystical experiences and the ones they, they defined were unity noetic quality ineffability, which is kind of amusing because that means indescribable. So it's almost like they're trying to describe the indescribable. Um, positive mood, which we'll talk a little bit about. Um, sacredness and transcendence of time or space. And they, they also cross-validated this with other scales um, and there were further demographic of another 440 people. And one of the things that w uh, was interesting to me was um, that they, they noted a lot of people who took psilocybin had this intuitive belief that the experience is an objective source of truth about reality, which is, I thought that was interesting because it's this idea of like, you, you're going to gain something unique from the experience, you're going to learn something, and it's going to at least feel very truthful and unique to that experience. Finally, I did mention that this study, um, it was quite biased to uh, white people in the US. Um, there was some suggestion that maybe there's a different kind of mystical experience in different populations. So maybe entheogen use isn't necessarily generalizable in that way. Like, yes, they're used across many different cultures, but maybe not every culture 
experiences in the same way. I just thought that was really interesting. Like maybe your cultural context allows you to um, have a different mystical experience. Well, you mentioned the um, neurotheology episode, but I just had to say this because we talked about the God gene in that episode and I came across this, um, an article and it had no scientific basis. Um, and they actually quoted Hammer in his book and I was just like, great. <laughs> they essentially said that psychedelics and how effective they are, like with regards to like with two particular people is based on one's genetics, bringing in the whole idea of the God gene, which I just think is kind of utter nonsense because there is more scientific evidence for alternative theories, which we can get into next. And I have a whole, whole thing about this. It is going to get maybe a little scientific um, towards the end. So just bear with me a little bit, but I do think it's interesting and important to understand maybe the basic mechanism by which these things seem to act. But Hanny, you talk about psilocybin here. Do you want to go through that first? Yeah, sure. So psilocybin is one that we'll bring up a lot, I think, because it's very well studied. It's present in lots and lots of different fungi. Um, as I mentioned, it's in magic mushrooms, but it's also in plenty of other hallucinogenic plants. Um, it's also well studied because it has a candidate role for treating depression. You've probably heard of people microdosing to address their depression. Um, and it's particularly interesting as well because people often have um, quite profound and long lasting experiences. So they don't just have a spiritual experience on the drug and then they go away and they live their lives. Often people will have a spiritual experience on the drug and many months down the line, as been shown in a few, few different studies, they that will have profoundly changed their perspective. So it's almost like you can have this perspective change. You can, you can do your um, kind of ritual work and you don't have to continue taking the entheogen to have the effect. It's, it's a, a long lasting change, which I thought was intriguing. And also um, it seems to increase in spiritual behavior. So maybe um, a nice intersection there with um, other behaviors like meditation, for example. So yeah, let's maybe go into how it works. On a more macroscopic level, theories, there's a couple of theories. Um, and they range from like down regulation of the default mode network or DMN in the brain to synchronization of brain waves via like neural oscillations. And a lot of this seems to go back to the episode where we talked about like brainwave entertainment, but this doesn't tell us a lot about the mechanism itself. And so to, to dive a little deeper, in 2003, Beatrick and his colleagues proposed the idea that consciousness alteration was due to a disruption of normal control processes. And they reviewed evidence reporting that the deregulation of higher order functions of the prefrontal cortex was associated with hypnosis, drug-induced states, meditation, and dreaming. And this was actually further substantiated later and actually is kind of continuously being studied by neurologists as an alteration of consciousness by disruption of normal brain activities as being something that can be achieved using many, many means. And they attribute the causes of this disruption to disconnectivity in brain dynamics. So, for example, um, Vatil et al., I'll include the link below if you want to read this study, found that many alterations of consciousness involved temporally disconnected oscillatory activity of the thalamocortical circuits or a defective connectivity between distributed brain regions. So, basically, that was a lot of big words. Um, but it's just talking about the connections between different regions of your brain. And this de this like disconnectivity that resulted then resulted in the emergence of activity in the ascending thalamocortical systems. And when this occurs, you have that disconnect between these systems and these regions. It produces hallucinatory experiences. So in regards to the default mode network, I find this particularly fascinating there are, were a number of researchers who reported psychedelic effects involving a disruption of the DMN. But before I get too far into this, I think it's crucial to explain like what the DMN actually is. So it's a network of regions, though it primarily involves connections among the thalamus, the posterior cingulate cortex, and the medial prefrontal cortex, and then also the limbic system, like which is the, where the hippocampus is. And these kind of collectively function as a hub for structural and functional connections that um, control a range of metacognitive processes that are attributed to things like introspection, daydreaming, imagination, future planning, all of that kind of thing. Based on that, you might think, well, oh, if this area is typically associated with daydreaming and stuff, then it totally makes sense that it would be involved in spiritual experiences. 
But what's interesting is that psychedelics lead to a dysregulation of this. It isn't normal. Otherwise, you'd be having some really wacky dreams. <laughs> so the basic of the this, of this system are that there is a stimulation of neurons that have these serotonin receptors. The disruption of this rhythmic oscillations of cortical neurons results in the disorganization of this cortical activity, causing the disconnectivity of those regions. So basically, because of that disconnectivity, we see reduced activity in the DMN regions, leading to less network integrity and then functionality, which is then what allows kind of these more spiritual, like weird experiences to then begin to take place. In a different study, actually, it was shown that a decreased integrity of DMN was reflected by a decreased functional connectivity between the, hippo the hippocampus and the retrosplenial cortex. And that's an area that's really heavily involved in like memory and imagination. And the magnitude of this disconnectivity was really strongly correlated with self-reported ratings of spiritual experiences and more specifically ego dissolution. And they had a couple of um, people share their experiences like who had engaged in this activity. And it was quite interesting to see some of the comments that were made. A lot of them had to do with like in a reflection, there was a lot of talk about the ego and how separation of the ego was so important or how the ego was like holding them back. Um, all of these kind of things, which I thought, would, I thought was actually really interesting. But entheogens outside of kind of this brain disconnectivity can also have very physical effects on the body. And that just adds to the experience for many people. Like we mentioned earlier, flying ointments contain nightshades rich in atropine or scopol scopolamine that can cause the heart to race and flutter, adding to this kind of physical effect that one is flying alongside the obvious effects of the drug. And it's important to keep in mind, right, that these physical, these physical effects also increase the, increase the danger. Um, like you mentioned earlier, if you have like a cardiac issue and you, you know, do anything that will like engage in that physically, it could cause more issues. But on the more microscopic level, so we're going to get chemical for a second, um, many drugs are serotonin, I see no pronunciation, man. Serotu ser serotonergic. Serotonergic. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Annie. <laughs> so the effect of these psychedelics, essentially how they work is that first they stimulate and they enhance your serotonin. And then by, which means that it just like makes a lot of it. So you got a lot of serotonin floating around. And this serotonin then saturates and overloads the serotonin system which then releases the serotonin repression to the dopam dopam dopaminergic. I, what is with all these GIC words? I swear. System. And what's interesting about this is that psychedelics have a resistance to normal uptake mechanisms. So when you take a psychedelic, your body essentially has ways of saying like, no, you can't come in this way that we would typically engage with certain drugs. And so instead of that, it kind of locks out the serotonergic transmitter sites and saturates the entire system. So by fully habituating the receptors, they then reduce the serotonin regulatory process. And that causes an excessive release of dopamine, which is partially why they're so uh, addictive sometimes, in addition to acetylcholine, which is then known pretty extensively to produce like visual symptoms such as hallucinations and dreaming. That's kind of like a scientific background as to how people think it works. Again, this is based on a good number of studies actually presently, but it's not, every psychedelic works a little bit differently and it will affect different transmitters and different chemicals. And so you can't take this as like a full backing, backing for every single psychedelic, but like generally speaking for anything that affects like the serotonin repression system, that's how it's going to work. Yeah, like the serotonin as well is quite important because it, it influences your mood and the positive mood is one of the things that was mentioned the most um, in the uh, questionnaire. Um, and also obviously um, the kind of ecstatic traditions would be relying on positive mood and a euphoria and ecstasy to induce that experience. I, fi I find it interesting that there are all these studies on brain connectivity, but I find it quite also quite difficult to grasp because it's, it's, it's difficult for me to say, oh, well, it's, you know, dysregulation in this area leads to this very complex specific effect. You, you know what I mean? Like people who take Datura often, they report these very specific experiences with seeing like shadow people or people who take DMT, they see these like machine elves. And it's hard for me to, to grasp how dysregulation in just one particular area of your brain could lead to this highly specific experience. 
not not doubting it, but I just think there's so much more to explore really when it comes to um, our understanding of the brain. I agree with that. I mean, I think the disconnectivity is, I think it's one of the better theories because also I recall when we did one of our other episodes, I think it was maybe the one on meditation and it showed that there was like decreased activity in the prefrontal cortex that led to more spiritual experiences. And we're seeing the same thing here, right? And all of these studies and they use MRIs and fMRIs that these spiritual experiences tend to occur when the uh, menial prefrontal cortex is not as lit up. Granted, there are plenty of things that can affect that. But there seems to be some substance to that theory that this disconnectivity somehow allows these spiritual experiences to kind of go through. I do think that more needs to be studied because the moment it's just like there's all these connections and you disrupt even one of them and it seems to have like this huge effect. So I don't think it's quite that simple. Um, But there does seem to be some consistency across like looking at this decrease in prefrontal cortex activity and spiritual experience. There's a few different theories for how it works on a spiritual level, although I'd really like to hear your thoughts as well. One of them is this idea of opening the doors of perception. So I actually found it really interesting what you were saying, Astra, about um, the Dietrich study where you have disruption in normal control processes, um, because this is a similar kind of concept where um, our brain in this theory would normally apply filters to sensory stimuli and um, we sense these and they, go, um, they are processed by our brain um, in order to produce our reality. So um, there's a theory that some psychotic symptoms could be caused by a dysregulation of this effect. For example, um, people who are experiencing psychosis might feel bugs and spiders on their skin because they're actually feeling nerve sensations from just air movements and things that would normally be filtered out. And that gets kind of changed and warped. Um, so this doors of perception model asserts that entheogens don't make you see something that isn't there but they allow you to perceive something which is always there by um, altering your sensory abilities. Um, Or there are kind of more literal kind of shamanic ideas where if if you're connecting to plant spirits, um, particularly with things like Datura, Brugmansia, um, I think it's really interesting because recreational users, although I don't know why you would use these things recreationally because they do make you see hell. Um, (laughs) Like notoriously, they make you see like shadow people. Um, But they, they have... They notoriously describe an experience where the plant is trying to show them something or they describe meeting the plant. So it's almost like this particular experience, this kind of spirit guide plant ally might be inherent to some plants. It's not just a side effect of like a shamanic tradition, but it's that is the experience that always happens with with all particular plants. But I think there were more theories as well. Do you guys have any um, hypotheses? So my theory actually falls along the lines of the first thing that you mentioned, which is that I think it just releases kind of like limit, like limitations and inhibitions that we naturally place on ourselves, not out of like intention, but just the fact that yeah, our like natural brain filters away all of these things. And then when you relax to such a state that you can kind of like let all that go, it allows you to experience things you would naturally like pay attention to. So that's kind of how I think entheogens work. It's mostly just like opening yourself up to a larger realm of possibilities instead of letting your objective mind be like, no, this can't happen. This can't happen because of, you know, whatever reasons. So that's how I think it works. Um, It's just opening yourself up to more stimuli that you would normally kind of process away or like reason away. Um, And then that allows you to have a more spiritual experience. I think that's also maybe why people like see spirits and, you know, angels and deities typically more often, you know, when they engage with entheogens, because it, it, again, kind of puts you in that like liminal state that you would also be in if you were like sleep deprived or um, if you had fasted or you were like an intense prayer or meditation. And I think it takes you to kind of the same state to just faster <laughs> and sometimes a little more intensely. It's probably worth mentioning as well that there's internal and external uh, mystical experiences. So external ones tend to be where you actually see a plant spirit, for example, or you um, you would feel like you're uniting with the world around you or maybe with a dissociative, you'd actually be disconnecting from it. Whereas an internal one is more like connecting with your inner God, your self-conscious um Maybe, I mean, it's, yeah, I guess you could say it's more psych model, but it's it's just a, a diff- difference in, in perception. Um, and I think maybe they could work um, on different spiritual levels, for example, but just interested to hear your thoughts. You'd probably, yeah, I think what you mentioned about maybe the model and what you believe will probably influence your experience, right? Like if you're more of an animist, you might engage more with like the, you partake of a particular plant and then you are able to like talk with or engage with that plant on like a very spiritual level level whereas like if you believed in a spirit 
um, model, maybe you would, it would be more external in nature where you would actually be seeing the spirits and you'd be able to have conversations with them. Or even if you worked in like an energetic model, you may be able to see like energy waves and stuff. I don't know. That might be like going a little bit too far. <laughs> but I, so yeah, I definitely think that the paradigm that you maybe believe in will probably influence your experience. I mean, I definitely think a lot of it, as we've said, is like loosening up those inhibitions. Um, I liked what you said, Henny, see things that were like always there or makes you notice things that were always there, like noticing feeling like the air on your skin or feeling like the hair follicles that normally your brain tunes out. So I think there's there's something to that. And then I think the spiritual experience arises kind of by like what comes up for you. I mean, I've kind of spoken about before that I have like a very like specific view of the divine i guess uh, or specific in the sense of like how how i i said it. i don't remember which episode it was i think it's our deities episode how i view deities is almost like running parallel to us and then it's like the parts where they touch where we are like ripples in a pool i don't really believe in um really big like i don't know if it's like phoning a friend or, or anything like that so i i see like the magical and the mundane so i feel like in that sense, the entheogen allows you to tune in even even deeper than you might normally be able to because your body just naturally tunes out certain things. So I guess to me, that's how the the spirituality would tie in there. Not that it's it's not that it's creating the spiritual experience, but it's allowing it to happen on a certain level. I also don't have a lot of entheogen experience, but that would be like my understanding of that and it's like why for me like i'll ritually drink because it, it lowers those inhibitions in that way it's not creating the spiritual experience it's it's my spiritual experience but this is helping helping this experience happen in the first place i guess yeah i also don't have a whole lot of like empty experience just because i don't feel comfortable like doing that personally um but if you have done it before and you have had this experience do please share with us what your experience has been um, I would love to hear more from people who maybe have engaged in entheogenic work and then the experiences, experiences that you've had as a result of that. Um, always curious to hear kind of how it affects other people and like what results from it. Um, something that I wanted to bring up as well was um, this idea of the kind of doors of perception and how you're maybe more aware of things around you. That reminds me of lots of things like body scan meditations. Um, and I guess that kind of brings us up to our next topic quite neatly. Um, do you think that these experiences can be created um, by things like meditation, prayer, fasting? Do you think that they can be created in the same way? Or is an entheogen induced experience always going to be kind of unique to that entheogen? For me, it's like prayer and meditation um, or like chanting a mantra and all of that is like a slower way to reach the same space. Whereas like an entheogen is kind of a fast track, right? Like it's instead of taking, you know, 20 minutes to like meditate and reach kind of that little space and then is like, you know, and like take it. And yeah, it might take some time to work, but like once it does, it works very intensely. And so I think that's like the biggest difference is both how long it takes and then also just the intensity of the experience. I think you can get to the same or a similar place using like prayer and meditation and chanting. It just won't be quite as forceful. I mean, I've done some, like I've done dance trancing. I've done chanting. Yeah, mostly I do a lot of movement trance work. Uh, it definitely like gets you to a certain place. It's definitely not the same experience as like an entheogen or or some, something like a literal substance that's altering you. I think it can get you to a similar experience. And it's not saying that one experience is worse than the others, but I don't think they're the same you know, like movement trance will often leave me feeling very buzzy because I'm literally moving my body. Sleep deprivation would leave you very floaty <laughs> because you're literally like and heavy because that's just sort of what happens physically to your body. So I don't think the experiences are really the same just because of the physical thing that is happening to your body. But I think you could have similar spiritual experiences, if that makes sense. I think the kicker for me is that whenever I have used entheogens, the experience has always been very very unique and I guess it's that ineffable thing again like it's it's very hard to describe but it's it's very particular to that plant or substance and I guess I lean slightly more towards the spirit model in that regard um but I one one example would be um I used uh henbane and um I had this experience where 
in my head, I could like feel myself like floating and above the earth and like looking down on everything around me. And I, I mentioned this to somebody and they were like, oh, like flying. I went, you were flying. I was like, duh. <laughs> like, of course. I, like, I, at the time, I hadn't really processed that and realized that. But, like, yeah, that's that's exactly the experience you expect. And you're like, but I kind of tried to go into it without too many expectations other, other than obviously checking safety and things. So the, the fact that it's so unique and it, it, it shows you one particular thing um, means that I don't think that they, they can necessarily be replaced by anything else. Um, I, I did also look into some paper, papers on this um, where basically they looked into experiences that were caused by psychedelics versus um, experiences that were caused by just other factors that could be like near, near death experiences even. Um, and it, it apparently um, experiences that were induced by psychedelics were rated as more intensely mystical um, resulted in a reduced fear of death um, and increased spirituality, which I thought was is intriguing. So it in, implies that they are there is something unique about them. And one other thing to mention maybe is most people using these in a ritual capacity, like some people are just using the things like LSD recreationally, for example. But um, in a ritual capacity, often you're combining these things, like you might ritually fast to purify, you might be sleep deprived as part of your like ritual prep, you might be like doing ritual dance and using an entheogen. It's kind of hard to separate them out. And so your experience is always going to be like really unique and particular to you. Um, I don't think it's necessarily like easy or useful to like disentangle one factor from another it's it's more important like what that experience means to you i do think that you like as practitioners that we would get the most out of an entheogen experience if it was done like a ritualistic setting um where there's multiple factors i haven't done that yet so i guess i'll experiment myself and see uh be safe um entheogens are in no way a requirement in paradigms they're not even necessarily like while they're historically used they're not historically used like for every experience i'd be curious to see us do an episode on like non-substance like trance um like how trance works when it when it is being altered from not ingesting something from i guess inside the body maybe might be a better way of phrasing that yeah i think my biggest thing is don't feel like entheogens need to be like a huge part of your practice i think that a lot of times people when they realize like entheogens were used historically by certain groups of people they then think that it's like a requirement and that you have to do it every single ritual to elicit some kind of spiritual experience pardon the plane if you can hear that um and that's not the case at all um and so i think if you're going to use them in your practice like use them sparingly because then not only will you have really meaningful experiences, you're also not putting yourself in danger of like overdosing on like a toxin from a plant or anything. Every time we do one of these episodes, I like come away with more questions than, than answers, I think, because there's so much neuroscience out there that is just like tantalizingly on the edge. Um, so yeah, I'd, I'd definitely like to discuss more about kind of non entheogen trans experiences um, and how those arise. But but yeah, I hope you learned something from this episode um, and we didn't confuse you more because it, it really seems like the science is, is kind of um, not quite there yet with a, a, a perfect explanation. All right. Well, thanks for listening, everybody. We appreciate your time. Um, let us know if you enjoyed the episode, either in the description in the YouTube comments or um, on the Instagram when the episode goes live. And we will see you next week. Bye, everyone. Have a good day. Mm-hmm.